Hello mysterious person behind the screen. So with Doctor Who's 60th anniversary year well behind us now, I thought it was time to do something that I have wanted to do for the longest time and since finishing uh, my big marathon of the entirety of the show last year, I think it's high time to rank every single season of Doctor Who from 1963 to 2023 using a tier maker. This list is something that I found on tier maker. I haven't made it myself, but I have adapted it. So I've added the 2009 specials and the 2023 specials because they're basically series in and of themselves. And I've also changed the title cards here. So we've got absolutely fantastic, which is the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Though the seasons that are in that are my favorites. Then we've got, I really like it does what it says on the tin really great solid seasons just maybe not at the top spot then we've got still got legs good solid seasons going there below that we've got oh i was never happy with that one which is sort of you know it's fine it's a fine season that's kind of the stuff that goes in there then scarcely bears thinking about which is sort of yeah this is a pretty rough season it's not for me but it's not terrible terrible and then at the bottom we've got no more which is the, the worst of the worst, essentially. So this could end up being a long one. We've got nearly 40 seasons to go through and 60 years worth of TV. Let's jump in with season one. So season one from 1963, for me, it goes into, I really like it. Season one, there's obviously teething issues. The early show is not the show that it would turn into, but it's absolutely magical the whole way through. I think the biggest weakness with season one is ultimately that they don't know what to do with Susan. And as a result, that TARDIS team doesn't quite function in the way that they should be. Having said that though, by like the Aztecs, everyone is kind of firing on, on all cylinders. The production team, the actors, it, it's just all working perfectly. And I think just being able to see the purest vision for the show is a real gift. And as a result, this first season, I always really enjoy going back to. There's some great stuff in there as well. Obviously, the Daleks is iconic. Uh, Marco Polo is fantastic. The Edge of Destruction is one I've watched so many times just because I think it's brilliant and cerebral and, and weird and I love it. The Aztecs is one of my favourite Doctor Who's ever. Really, I think the only weak spot is probably the Sensorites and even then that's like a 5 out of 10. So it's a solid first go. It doesn't reach the top spot just because I think there were those teething issues that future seasons would improve on. But season one, it's a very solid start and it does go in. I really like it. And so does season two. Season two... It, it's better than season one for me. It still doesn't reach into the, the top uh, upper echelons of absolutely fantastic, mostly thanks to the web planet. But season two, it feels like a more confident, well-oiled machine. It feels like they learned from what didn't work about season one and they fixed that for season two. The departure of Susan and the introduction of Vicky, as I said before, I don't think Susan ever really worked as a character and Vicky is kind of them going, okay, what didn't work about Susan? we're going to fix that and as a result you get Vicky who is one of my very favourite companions. I think she's wonderful and the relationship she has with the Doctor is so sweet and this is Hartnell at his peak I think. This is William Hartnell at the peak of his powers. It's that perfect balance between the genuinely quite nasty character that we saw at the start of season one and the softer uh, warm grandfather with the twinkle in his eye that you get through like, the, a lot of his run as well and I just think season two is the perfect mix of it. I think there's more variety, I think there's more pace to the stories. The, like I say the only weak link is the web planet and that is a a weak link it's a bad story but overall season two does feel more confident and it does feel like a better run than the first so yeah i really like it then we have season three which has to go in oh i was never happy with that one um it's fine i think the, th the thing with season three it's a mess it's also one of the seasons of Doctor Who that I am most fascinated by. Every time there's a news about like a, a long lost photo recovered from season three or anything to do with season three, I'm always interested because it's the first time the show kind of shits itself. We've got Verity Lambert leaving as producer. John Wiles comes in and Hartnell isn't happy. The conflict between him and John Wiles bleeds through onto the screen and as a result the whole season is just this mess and it is a revolving door of departing companions departing actors departing producers departing crew members new new people come in then they go the next story it, it's it's a mess and it, it's i think the reason although there's some great stuff in it like dalek's master plan i'm a big fan of the savages that's that's quite an underrated one um it doesn't reach the top spot for me because it is just a mess, and I, I never feel like we see John Wiles and Donald Tosh's vision for the show clearly on screen, because they never really had a chance to do it. And then, you know, for the last sort of third of the season, you've got um, Jerry Davis and Innes Lloyd coming in to 
pick up the pieces from uh, the fallout of, of Dalek's master plan and the massacre and it's just it's a weird season and it's a fascinating one because there's so much of it that is missing and so much of it that we can't see more so than season four now I think it used to be that season four was the most missing but that's been you know animated to high heaven season three there's stuff like the massacre where we just have no idea what Hartnell looked like playing the abbot and and stuff like that where I'm like god there's so much of the season that is just a complete mystery to us and that fascinates me so I have a great fondness for season three but I can't put it any higher than the it's fine category <laughs> Season 4, this is, I think, going to be quite a controversial opinion. I think it's a big mixed bag. People love Season 4. Does it go in there or just into Still Got Legs? I think, uh, yeah, it's just into Still Got Legs, but I think it's a low. <laughs> it's, it's low in that category. So it, it's a good season, but it's a bit of a mixed bag. It has the same problem with season three in that it is a very much a transitional period. Patrick Triton's first season as the Doctor, Hartnell's in the first two stories, but Pat Triton takes over. And it's impressive that although Hartnell is in the first two stories, this feels through and through like Triton's season. It's it's his season. It, it doesn't feel like he's sharing it with, with Hartnell. This is his season. And that's really impressive. He immediately makes an impression and he immediately sort of makes an impact on the show. And I think that's brilliant. The actual stories I find range from really, really fantastic, like Power of the Daleks and the Macro Terra and the Moon Base, to really quite boring and dull, like the Highlanders. I've never been a fan of the Faceless Ones. And I really don't like Evil of the Daleks. I just, Evil of the Daleks is maybe my vote for the most overrated Doctor Who story, because it is just seven episodes of just running around in circles and I've ne I, I don't click with it unfortunately but also I sympathize with the production team here because it was like holy shit we've lost the doctor now we're getting in a new doctor and we've got to find the tone of that and it, you know his performance is going to dictate the tone of the show um so as a result it is you know all all simply all sympathies to them because it must have been a nightmare and it's kind of a miracle that the season is as good as it is although i don't rate it as highly as some it does have to go in the good category because you have got those absolute classics in there and triton's great so yeah season five the first one for me to go in the absolutely fantastic column because season five you can feel the relief of the production team you can kind of feel that this is the production team finally breaking free of all of the transitional periods that played seasons three and four they're finally free of that and they can just focus on telling a fucking good season of tv with some great stories it is the monster season i think this is where 60s who reaches peak iconography with the web of fear i don't think 60s who ever got more evocative or atmospheric than it did there. Tomb of the Side Men is an absolute masterpiece. It's a classic. Enemy of the World is great. Fury from the Deep is wonderful. I love that story. At a point, season five hits a run that is just so consistently good every single story, and then it trips up at the end with the wheel in space, which is shit. <laughs> um, and it's such a shame because it really breaks the good streak, but it isn't enough to stop season five being the best season so far it's it's absolutely fantastic then we get season six which is another mixed bag um and i'm gonna put it in the oh i was never happy with that one column because it's it's fine it's okay it, it's 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 the definition of a, of a mixed bag you've got fantastic stuff in there like the invasion and the war games um the mind robber and equally you've got stuff like the dominators and the crotons and the Space Pirates, which is my least favourite Doctor Who story ever. So it's another one where you can feel the behind the scenes issues. Triton obviously wasn't happy at this time and it, obviously it's his last season. So there's some great stuff in there. Ultimately, it doesn't quite come together as well as it should. Season 7, John Pertwee takes over. The show moves into colour and it is absolutely fantastic. Probably, is it 
Yeah, I think it is better than season five. It's the best one so far. It is the first season with no bad stories. Now that may be giving it a bit of an unfair advantage because there's only four of them, but my God, those four are phenomenal. Spearhead from Space is one of my favorites ever. Doctor Who and the Silurians is a really haunting tale to watch post COVID. Ambassadors of Death is the weakest of the season, but it's still got all the strengths that season seven excels in. And Inferno is a wonderful end to the season that uh, it's many people's favorite third doctor stories and you know for good reason because it is fantastic season seven feels like unlike anything that the show has done before or since it is a really 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 strong reboot for the show essentially it's so different it is so well put together and so confident and that kind of quater mass feel that this season has yeah you really kind of cut it nothing comes close to it in terms of feeling that way and as a result it has to be you know absolutely fantastic there's no bad stories in it the doctor and liz one of my favorite teams ever i really really wish liz got another go in another season but it wasn't to be sadly this is controversial i'm not a fan of season eight i'll put it at the bottom of fine because the thing about season eight is on the one hand it deserves a hell of a lot of praise for really being the purest vision of i think what barry lets and terence sticks their vision of the show it cements the unit family it cements the sherlock moriarty dynamic between the doctor and the master the masters in every story you know it deserves a lot of praise for cementing probably i think when people think of the third doctor era they're thinking of this season because it's so heavily focused on unit and the master and the doctor and joe and that's all great the problem is i don't think the stories are actually very good apart from uh the first one and the last one i think terror of the autons is fantastic and i think the demons is maybe my ideal tone for a doctor who story i think it's brilliant it's it's probably my favorite pertwee the rest though i've never clicked with the mind of evil the way that a lot of people do i really want to but it's just never done it for me claws of axos i think is fine and colony in space i just think is shit so i it's one of those things where it's like really i only like two of the stories so it kind of has to be the weakest season so far even though it deserves a lot of praise for you know cementing the tone of the era uh that God, people are gonna hate me <laughs> season nine is a solid season and it sits comfortably in the still got legs category it's a good solid run but it's really with season nine there's almost not a lot you can say about it because it's the first season and i think one of the only seasons in doctor who when nothing really significant happens there's no introduction for a companion no one leaves there's no big change in the production team the most significant thing that happens is i guess the introduction of the sea devils apart from that nothing really significant happens it's just a solid run of doctor who that kind of sees the production team really cementing their vision for the show and just giving you some really good stories ultimately there's some great stuff here i love the curse of peladon i love the sea devils i don't mind the mutants either i used to really find it really boring but actually watching it on this marathon it's it was, it was fun it's decent it is too long but there's some good stuff in there really the only weak link is the finale the time monster which is you know it really has to be seen to be believed that one <laughs> season 10 um i think i prefer season 9 but it sits comfortably still in the still got legs category it's, it's another good season it's one of those things where i think all of the stories are pretty good it's just i don't gel with frontier and space the way i want to and obviously that kind of arc the dalek war stuff is such a big part of the season and it's not something that i really gel with very much even though it's pretty good it's decent stuff it's just it's not really for me but the rest of it's great i really like uh three doctors carnival of monsters both of them are really fun um, and the Green Death is, is again, it's that or the demons is, is uh, probably my favourite John Pertwee story. It's, you can kind of feel the excitement of the production team being able to leave Earth again. Like, just that, that, you can tell that they're fizzing with the, with the story, you know, ideas and potentials. And, um, that's really great and I love all that. Um, so yeah, season 10, it's a good season. Season 11 is obviously a bit of an odd one. It's, uh, very much the era winding down. Um, but it's pretty good overall, I think, uh, I'll put it at the bottom of, of Still Got Legs. The, the big, what drags it down is Death to the Daleks and the Monster of Peladon. Those two in the middle, I struggle with them both, especially Monster of Peladon. I find that 
really dull. I think it's one of the most boring Doctor Who's. But I think, you know, Time Warrior is pretty fun. I really like Invasion of the Dinosaurs. I think that's really it's such an intelligent script. Um, and I have a big soft spot for Planet of the Spiders. I know it's a bit crap, but I really like it, and I've watched it a lot. So, yeah, I think season 11 it's, it has got this weird charm to it. It does feel odd. It almost feels like the third Doctor's a bit out of place in that season. Because obviously the title sequence has changed. You've got Sarah Jane, the introduction of Sarah Jane. And it, it does definitely feel like the whole era is winding down. But there's some great stuff in there, and it's... Yeah, it's an interesting one, season 11. Very very much unique season. Um, just the feel of it is, is quite interesting. So, yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. Season 12. I really like it. A uh, really, really great intro for Tom Baker. Um, all of the stories are fantastic, apart from Revenge of the Cybermen, which is crap. I don't think the season is as rewatchable as what is to come which you'll see in a minute but um it's it's a, it's a very strong debut for for tom baker's doctor and from the arc in space onwards philip hinchcliffe's vision of the show um and robert holmes's script editor as well obviously it's uh it's yeah it's great well i mean it's got it's the season that's got genesis of the daleks in it what more can you say it's a fantastic run i really like the fact that all of the stories are connected yeah fantastic stuff uh not much i can say about season 12 that hasn't already been said it is a fantastic season and uh, i look forward to revisiting it again very soon but as good as season 12 is yeah season 13 i mean come on it's 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 in the absolutely fantastic column and I'm going to put it as the best one so far, because although Planet of Evil has never worked for me, really, and I'm a bit iffy on it, I mean, it's season 13. <laughs> it's Doctor Who's Halloween special season. All of, the, like, the amount of absolute classics in this. I mean, you've got Terror of the Zygons, uh, Brain in Morbius, Pyramids of Mars, The Seeds of Doom. Um, I like the Android Invasion. It's good fun. Um, I don't know if it really holds together, but it's really good fun. And just, yeah, the uh, the team of, of to Tom Baker at the peak of his powers and Sarah Jane, they've just got a wonderfully well-oiled chemistry and it's absolutely fantastic. And I mean, season 13, yeah, <sighs> it's, it's just a fantastic season and it's, it's one of those sort of, it's one of Doctor Who's monolithic seasons. There's, it's just so massive because it's so popular and everyone, everyone loves it and, and rightly so. And uh, I actually think season 14 improved on it again. Season 14 is my favourite of the Hinchcliffe and Holmes era. It's them kind of seeing out their tenure on an absolute high. The only story I don't really gel with is um, Mask of Mandragora, and even that I, I sort of got a new appreciation for a little bit. Again, it just learns from what came before with season 12 and season 13. I just think this production team at this point were kind of unstoppable, and it's, it's a shame that they all moved on at the end of this, because... Ah, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. I think the introduction of Leela, who is one of my very favourite companions. Deadly Assassin is in this season. Hand of Fear is really good fun. Robots of Death is one of my favourites ever. Talented Wang Chiang, bit racist, but as a story, it's very good. It's just a great season. Season 14, it's my vote for the best of the Hinchcliffe era. Season 15, I'm going to be a defender of this one. I'm going to put it in... Still got legs, maybe, yeah, top of still got legs. I'm a defender of season 15. I think people write season 15 off as the beginning of the end for the Tom Baker era. Obviously, Graham Williams takes over and Ant Anthony Reed takes over as script editor. And yeah, that transition period isn't smooth. But you know what, season 15, it's underrated as fuck, in my opinion. Because you've got, the, the, uh, the only stuff that lets it down are the last two, Underworld and... Um, uh, Invasion of Time are the only two weak ones, but for the, the rest of the season, it's great fun. It's really good fun, and Tom Baker and uh, Louise Jameson, they weren't getting on when they filmed this, but you kind of can't tell, because I think Leela in this season, and her relationship with the Doctor, it's really that that makes me think this is an underrated one, in my opinion. I, I really like those two together in this season, and yeah, watching it on this marathon, I was really having a great time with season 15. I, I'm quite excited for when the collection box set comes out, because what usually happens with those sets, they come out, and whatever season it is, always gets a reappraisal, and it always gets a little more, bit more love from fans, just because it's kind of in the current discussion. And I'm looking forward to seeing 15 have its day, because I think it is an underrated run. And uh, yeah, stop 
stop hating on it. It's it's a good season, and I think it is the best of the Williams era. Season 16 is a mixed bag, but overall, I, I get, I, I, yeah, it does deserve, oh, I don't know. I'll put it at the bottom of Still Got Legs, because it is a good season, and it does deserve a lot of credit for being the first story arc season, really. Season 16 is the first time the show does a season-long arc that binds every story together, and for that, it has to get credit, because 16 years into the show, and it was still evolving and innovating and do doing new things, and that, you know, you've got to give it credit for that. Uh, does it does get a bit diluted as it goes on and I think by the time you get to power of crawl and Armageddon factor I mean fuck me the season's just gone so far off the rails but it it, it has to it has to get credit for the story arc and Romana one who is my personal favorite incarnation of Romana I think she's fantastic I love Mary Tam and I love her relationship with Tom Baker in the season it, it it's a real kind of counterpoint to how he was in season 15 where he could be a bit of a nasty piece of work sometimes and it's kind of nice that you've got in this season a character who exists to basically call him out on his shit and that it's such a refreshing companion uh, doctor dynamic and so I think for those reasons season 16 just about goes into still got legs even if it kind of loses its way a bit later on season 17 it has to go in scarcely bears thinking about it. it is a weak season and it really the show needed a big kick up the arse at this point. I don't hate Romana 2 as a character, and I think Lala Ward is very, very good in that role. Um, she's very charming. My problem with Romana 2 and the Doctor is the fact that you kind of lose that sense of sparring that you had with Mar uh, Romana 1. With uh, Mary Tam's Romana, you've got a sense of tension underneath everything. They, they loved each other, but they were sort of like, oh, you know, that, that, kind, of, that kind of tone. Romana 2, there's kind of none of that, and as a result, you're, you are kind of watching two extremely intelligent, pompous twats <laughs> flying about through space and time, so there's no counterpoint to the Doctor as much, and that doesn't really work for me as a dynamic, and there are points with Romana 2 where I find her really not like Creature from the Pit, it wasn't her fault, it's, it's well documented that Creature from the Pit is kind of uh, Lala Ward figuring how figuring out how to play Romana and that's fine however she's really irritating in it good boy k9 it's oh it goes through me I'm sorry it goes through me and yeah it seems it's just a weak set of stories um unfortunately it's just not a great set of stories even with Sharda doesn't really save it but city of death is one of the all-time greats so it's got that going for it season 18 big change for the show it's certainly gone up in my estimation to, for just how kind of experimental and weird it gets and how much of, a, of an injection of energy it is, but I'm going to put it below season three. It's, I think it's better than season eight, but it's just not for me. I, I, I admire it more than I enjoy it because it is a lot of very heavy-handed, quite morose stories about hard science and quite cerebral concepts which is cool every now and then but i kind of like my doctor who to have a balance and season 18 kind of swings too far in that direction for me and tom baker looks fucking miserable throughout the entire thing which you can't really blame him because it was a pretty rough time in his life but yeah it just doesn't quite work for me i think the e-space trilogy is a good concept and a good set of stories Megalos is a bit shit. Leisure Hive, Leisure Hive is actually, I, I used to hate the Leisure Hive, but watching it this time, it's a real injection of energy for the show, and it's directed beautifully. And I like Keeper of Trachan and Logopolis, so it, it, it's sort of, I like the stories, but the tone of it just isn't for me, and as a result, it's not one of my favourites. Season 19, though, goes in the I really like it column, and, oh, is it better than season 12? I... I kind of enjoy it more than season 12, but it, it's not as good as season 12. I really love season 19. It's one of my favourite Doctor Who seasons to just stick on and watch and just chill out to. I really like the dynamic of the fifth Doctor and Tegan and uh, Nyssa and Adric. I know people hate the bickering and it does get annoying at some points, but it, it feels like a family. And I don't think you've really had that since the third Doctor's era by this point in the show. So by the time you get to it, it feels quite refreshing. I, I, I'll kind of forever go to bat for season 19. I think there's some really fantastic stuff in there. I love Kinder. I love the visitation. 
I really love Earthshock. Black Orchid, I really, really like. I've, I've watched Black Orchid so many times, um, and it never gets old for me. Of course, you do have to talk about Time Flight, and I'm not hugely a fan of Fall to Doomsday, but it's alright. Those two drag it down, but ultimately, just the tone of the season, it feels like a breath of fresh air, and it feels fresh and fun and new, and Peter Davison's Doctor feels really kind of, like, energetic and, like, boom, boom, boom in it. I love season 19, and I think I always will. It's, it's underrated. Oh, season 20. It's a weak season. Mm, does it go in no more? I think it kind of does, you know? Or maybe Scarcely Bears Thinking. I'll put it in Scarcely Bears Thinking about... I do prefer it to season 17, actually. I think just the... the I, I just prefer the TARDIS team in, in season 20 than I do in 17. I think that kind of swings it. Um, it's a weak season to celebrate the anniversary year. It, there's not a huge amount I can say about it, really. It just feels like after season 19 was a massive injection of energy, season 20 just feels like a, a bit of a tired wheeze of a season. But it does, if you include the five Doctors in this, that does raise it up because of the five doctors is great. And I like Snake Dance. Snake Dance is really good. But um, the rest of it, yeah, it's not great. Season 21. Uh, I really like it, but it's not as good as season 19 for me. It, go, it goes here. Season 21 is really good, and it has got maybe the best Doctor Who story ever made with the case of Vandrazani. Uh, and Resurrection of the Daleks is very good, and I like The Awakening, but it's also got two of the worst Doctor Who's ever. It's got Warriors of the Deep and The Twin Dilemma, so as a result, I can't really put it above Season 19. However, I think this was the season where they really found Peter Davison's Doctor. I mean, I love him as the Doctor anyway, and he, he, gets, he gets a bit of stick as the Doctor, but he's one of my favourites. But this is the season where I think they really found his voice for the Doctor. He's really good in all of this, even even Warriors of the Deep. It does feel like a real kind of exciting season. It feels like the show is changing. However, at times it can feel very mean-spirited. Get used to that. Um, and yeah, I, th I just think the Twin Dilemma is, it's, it kind of killed the show. It, and that's, it's, it was the beginning of the end of, of classic Doctor Who and as a result, it does kind of have to go, it, get, it does kind of have to drag the season down because of that. But Caves of Androzani, one of my very favourites, it is a masterpiece of TV. I think Caves, Caves of Androzani, I had never appreciated it quite as much as I did watching it on this marathon. It is a fantastic piece of television and I just love it more with every viewing. It, it's, I think it is the best, best classic Doctor Who story, maybe the best Doctor Who story ever. It is, it is just incredible. Season 22 is a mixed bag, and I'm going to put it in... Uh, I'm going to put it here. I do think it's better than season 16, but there's not a lot in it. Season 22, and to be honest, the whole of the Colin Baker era, and it's not Colin's fault, he's a, he's a fantastic Doctor. The problem is, the behind-the-scenes drama with the conflict between Eric Saywood and Ian Levine and John Nathan Turner, it just bleeds into the show, and this and the next season, it, it, it just is the infighting of this production team bleeds into the show way too much, and as a result, the whole season feels a little bit toxic, just from the behind the scenes stuff and, and just everything. I don't mind the darker tone, however, at points it just becomes mean-spirited, and it just becomes sort of like... The, there's only so many times you can go that dark and kind of expect a shocked reaction out of me because after a while I'm just like well this is, this is this is just what this show is now so I'm I'm not shocked this is just part of the course I don't think the 45 minute format works at all because the writers haven't adjusted the story structure it takes the Doctor and Perry eons to get into any of the stories I think that's a big problem with this season if you were gonna turn it into a 45 minute format you had to look at the scripts and change the structure of it and have a look at that format unfortunately they didn't they were basically still trying to make four parters just in 45 minutes and as a result it doesn't work but there are some great stories in there I like Attack of the Cybermen I like the two doctors I like Revelation of the Daleks I like the Mark of the Rani a lot that was actually a real kind of surprise when I rewatched that how much I enjoyed that especially the music it was gorgeous um, and Colin Baker's fantastic, uh, you know, and that can't be denied. It's just a shame that 
this whole era is just overshadowed by what's going on externally. And ditto for, for season 23. It's fine. Um, I'm gonna put it below season 8. It's, yeah, it's it's not great. It, the problem is it's sort of like... It, I think it was an ill-judged idea. It feels ambitious, and you have to give it credit for them going, right, we want to come back and we want to make a statement for us coming back after getting cancelled, essentially. Unfortunately, it just... Again, it's just the behind-the-scenes stuff. It just feels like a trouble production from beginning to end. It doesn't hold together. The trial, uh, the trial stuff is interminable by the end. I just think it was a misstep. I just think the whole thing was a misstep, and it's it's such a shame. Because it's not a terrible idea, like having a, a 14 episode series where the Doctor is on trial for the whole of it, having to prove his innocence. Sounds like a good concept, I just think it gets bogged down in like Gallifrey and Law, and I think the Master pops up and it just becomes tiresome by that point. The Valiard is a cool idea, but it's an incredibly nebulous concept. And I just come away from the season being like, man, Colin Baker just deserved so much more than that run. Um, and it's such a shame that this was it for him, because he never got a chance to shine on TV, sadly. And that, I think, is one of the biggest kind of injustices in the world of Doctor Who. But, tell me. Season 24. <laughs> I really like it. And I'm going to put it here, because I kind of can't put it much higher, because it is season 24. And it is a bit shit. But you know what it is? It is a raised fist to the future. It is a dynamic comeback. It is the kick up the arse that the show needed for a few years. It is an injection of life and energy. It feels genuinely modern. Modern as of 1987. But it feels like this kind of evolution of the music. And the way it's directed. And the way it's kind of written and scored. This is what should have been happening for Colin Baker. This is the change that should have happened for Colin. And okay, you may not like that how camp it is, and it is camp. Oh my god, is it camp. But it's fun. And that is something that has been sorely missing since season 19. I think people look at season 24 and they just see the daftness, they just see the silliness, they just see the camp, and they don't bother to look beneath the surface at what it's really doing. I think Time and the Rani is the big weak link. And that's the only one that feels like what I think people think the whole season is, which is to say camp and fluff and colourful nonsense and really silly colourful nonsense with no depth to it. That's the only one that feels like that for me. The rest of them feel genuinely exciting. It's Doctor Who being comic booky. it's Doctor Who being fun, it's Doctor Who doing really biting satire in Paradise Towers. I genuinely think season 24 does some of the most exciting stuff the show has attempted in years up until this point. It's really since the Blu-ray set come out that I've started to appreciate it a lot more because I do genuinely think it's a great season and I really like it, I'm sorry. And season 25 is absolutely fantastic to me. I think it is a uh, distillation. I'll put it at the bottom of absolutely fantastic, but it's still absolutely fantastic. It is a distillation of everything that season 24 did right, and it kind of cuts out the campier elements in terms of moving forward the show into the modern times and really giving it a kick up the arse in terms of energy and vibrancy and just the intelligence of the scripts. Remembrance of the Daleks is one of my all-time favourites, the greatest show in the galaxy, I could wax lyrical about it, I could go on about how, how amazing that story is for ages. Happiness Patrol is really good fun, and Silver Nemesis, it's not a lot to it, but it's, it's fun, it's a good run around, and the whole season just adds to the whole era's idea that it's just this really interesting meta commentary on the state of the show itself it's so intelligently done fuck it season 26 is going to go in there too and i think it is better than 25 just by a little by a small margin those two seasons just prove that the show has so much more life in it yet than the chance it got season 25 is great and season 26 the level that it's operating at i just think Battlefield isn't like one of my favourites, but it's still really good fun. Then you get to Ghostlight, which is, I think, you know, if there's a term for, you know, elevated horror, Ghostlight is elevated Doctor Who. I still don't fully understand it, but I'm getting closer, and with every viewing, I kind of unlock its mysteries a little bit more than I have done before. It's such an intelligent script, and again, what it is saying about the state of the show is really fascinating and then you get into Curse of Fenric and Survival which are these deconstructions of Ace's character in a way that the show hadn't ever done before. This is what I mean, like you know from season 24 onwards 
the the show really starts to do things that the classic series had never done very modern things very modern bits of storytelling and as a result you do get one of the most dynamic exciting and engaging eras in the show's history and it sucks that season 26 was the end for the classic series because it is so exciting what was happening to the show and Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred as, as the Doctor and Ace unbeatable just so so good together god I love the McCoy era so much it's just incredible the movie the classic series is done now we've got the movie and it's flawed it's very Americanized it's very silly but it's um I, I have watched it quite a bit I'm gonna put it in still got legs I think it's yeah yeah fuck it it's yeah top has still got legs it's a good 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 film it's a good fun Paul McGann is one of my very favorite doctors and he's amazing in this he's so good in it um, just the way he looks at things and reacts to, to, to what's going on around him is is so fun to watch. And again, it's a crime he never got a full run on TV because he, he, he's just terrific in it. It's daft, it's nonsense, it's very silly, but it's 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 Doctor Who the movie. Um, what more can you say about it? Now we get into the revived era. Not really new Who anymore because, of course, they're resetting the numbering next season. So... Uh, the, the, the revival, the revival, the first revival anyway, was series one, and it is absolutely fantastic. I think it goes here. Given that the production behind it was a fucking disaster, it is incredible that series one is as good as it is. I think series one is... It, it, it's a near-perfect season of TV. It's a near-perfect story told over 13 episodes. The, the, this, this beautiful arc of the Doctor healing and learning to become the Doctor again is, is a wonderful and exciting and kind of perfect way to bring the character back after so many years um, and to you know relaunch the show. Billy Piper's amazing in it and just the hit rate, the one week story in it is the long game and even that is just 6 out of 10 at worst. It is a truly truly stellar season of television and obviously naturally belongs in the absolutely fantastic column series two you know what this was always i feel like series two is kind of the black sheep of the first rtd era because a lot of people really dislike it and i it was always my least favorite of them and it probably still is my least favorite rtd series but re-watching it i had a blast with series two and i i, I am gonna put it in uh i really like it above season 24 Above season 19, not quite as good as season 12, um, but series 2 is great, and I know it's got flaws, Fear Her is fucking naff, and I think it is the first episode of The Revival that just doesn't work, but the rest of it, I love. It's ambitious, and it's bold, and it really swings for the fences, and as a result, it doesn't always hit, but when it does hit, good god it hits, and when it misses, you can at least see the attempt. I know people hate the 10th Doctor and Rose together, and they can be irritating, but that is kind of the point. And I, I was never a 10 Rose chipper or a hater, really. I never really had a strong feeling on their romance or relationship at all. But I'm not going to lie, at the end of this marathon, watching Doomsday, I, I welled up on that beach scene. Whatever you think of the romance, that scene at the end of Doomsday... There's a reason it has become so iconic. There's a reason that people now on the street still remember that scene and how big it was. And it is because of the, the fantastic performances between David Tennant and Billy Piper and the music and the writing. It is a wonderful exit for them. And um, I love it. And I love the whole series. You know, it's got some of my favourites ever in there. I love the Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. Love of Monsters. I adore it. There's great stuff in there. And... I think it is underrated. I had a really good time with Series 2, watching it back again. Series 3 is my all-time favourite season of the show, and therefore it goes straight to absolutely fantastic top spot. Now, I am biased because it was my first series. It was the series that got me into the show, and therefore I will always be very uh, biased towards it. And I acknowledge that. This is my Doctor Who. This is my series. So it was maybe always going to be my favourite. But even aside from that, I think it's got the best story arc that Doctor Who has ever done. I think it's like, say what you will about the finale, that the sound of drums is 
an incredible episode. It's so good with them on the run and everything. Like the the stakes are genuinely sky high, and it feels like the world is coming to an end. And I don't know that the stakes have ever been that high again. Maybe series five, but it's brilliant. It's 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 absolutely fantastic. I love Martha. She's one of my very favorite companions. Just the whole tone of it, I love. And um, it's just it's just my favorite. It's just my favorite. Um, like I say, it was my first, so I am biased, but. It's the best. It's just the best. It's just the best. And people may disagree with me on it. Series 3 for me is, is kind of peak Doctor Who. And it's never really gotten better than that for me. Series 4 I think is overrated. You know, people love Series 4. Series 4 is, is often, I think it is probably the most popular series of Doctor Who ever. For me it plateaus in the middle. I think the Sontaran 2 parter is quite weak and I don't like the Doctor's daughter. However, you cannot deny the greatness within. It is consistently good after that kind of stumble in the middle. And as a result, it has to go in absolutely fantastic. I think it is below these guys. And I think maybe below season 25 as well. I think it does go at the bottom of absolutely fantastic. But that five episode run at the end is just, oh, genuinely watching that on broadcast in 2008. I don't know that I've ever been in the midst of such a consistently 10 out of 10 run of episodes ever in, in British TV, like just watching that week on week from Silence in the Library onwards. The series just, just like, it, it, it is literally 10 out of 10 episodes until Journey's End, which Journey's End is, is not as good as The Stolen Earth and it is a bit weaker and the ending is a little bit meh, but it's still good fun. And I think The Stolen Earth, the first part, is, is another 10 out of 10. I just think there's a reason why Series 4 is so popular. I think The Doctor and Donna, it's one of the best Doctor companion pairings ever. There's a reason they got brought back for the 60th specials, and there's a reason everyone loves them so much. So although I do think Series 4 is a bit overrated, it is still comfortably an absolutely fantastic column. The specials, the 2009 specials, um, they're a mixed bag. I think they're, they're in still got legs, they're good. However, um, yeah, I'll put them here. I don't think they're, they don't reach the heights of season four. Um, but overall, I think they're, they're slightly stronger than season 11. I'm not a huge fan of the next Doctor and Planet of the Dead. Waters of Mars is obviously fantastic. And the end of time, I think, represents the, the best and the worst of RTD's run. There's a lot of his weaknesses in there. But there's a lot of the stuff that, like, every time I watch it, I go, that is why I... I'm such an RTD fanboy. I just think the run is a little bit... Every time I watch it, I am just kind of like biding my time waiting to get to series five. I just think it's a little bit tired by that point. I think the show is in need of a change by that point. And it does buckle under its own weight a little bit. It does get a bit exhausting by the time you get to the end of time. And, you know, it's all the prophecy stuff. I am a bit like... I think it's time for just a little bit of a clean slate. So it's a decent run, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it's good overall. And then Series 5, which, yeah, strong contender for, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to put it there. I think Series 5 is, is hella slapped on, because Series 5, watching it on broadcast in 2010, it did genuinely become, like, my life <laughs> as a kid watching it. It was just like... Oh, because it was the first kind of reboot of the show that I had lived through in terms of like everything changed But it was still the same and that was the first time I really lived through that and as a result It was just the most exciting thing in the world and uh, Every time I've revisited it, it gets better and better and just watching it for this marathon. I just It's an incredible series of telly. It's the fairy tale series and it's this beautifully tragic and, and, and romantic and haunting fairy tale and it's it's a series about stories and and, and memories and and uh, dreams and and what what it says about someone to kind of remember them and and to tell stories about somebody and what that says about that person and and it's these wonderfully sort of melancholic ideas that it explores and it's it's beautiful it, it's beautiful it really it kind of really tugs at my heartstrings especially at the end when you get to like uh the doctor at amy's bedside um you know tucking her in and stuff it is it is just it's lovely and it is one of my favorite things to come out of doctor who is that whole fairy tale story 
that was told. This is maybe my ideal characterization of the Doctor, specifically Series 5, 11. I think after this they do ramp up the silliness too much. But in Series 5 he's a little bit, and I'd forgotten about this, he is a little bit irritable and he's a little bit snappy. But he's still really fun and he's still got that kind of uh, quirky inventor, scientist to him, you know, and he's always kind of holding himself like this. And uh, I just, Matt Smith nails it. It's just, he's just perfect in this series and I don't think he ever got that good again I don't know I just series 5 for me is is just it, it, it is just magical and just the story of just when you say it you know the story of Amelia Pond and her imaginary friend like it's just it's, it's gorgeous it's so lovely and I just love the whole series series 6 uh this is kind of where I think people go oh that's where it kind of started to go wrong and I was like that for a bit I think it's at the top of Still Got Legs. I think the arc is what drags it down because it does go into, I think, the worst of, of Stephen Moffat's traits as a writer. Like, it's really fucking horny and weirdly so. And it's way too overcomplicated. But the ambition on display in Series 6 is really something to behold. Like, it's an ambitious story that it's telling. I just think it buckles under its own weight in, in, and it just falls on its ass. The finale is just a write-off for me because it, 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 it just cheats. It just cheats. It's like, you know, you set up this whole mystery throughout the entire series about the Doctor dying and then it's, you know, it was a robot. It's just a test, you know, it's just a duplicate. He's fine. It does buckle under its own weight. But when I think of the high points of Series 6, there are so many high points. And I, I think, yeah, just the ambition of it there's a lot of good stuff in there. I, I, you know, I the opener's great. Night Terrors is great. I love the girl who waited and the god complex. Like the one-two punch of those is just like, oh, it's just so good. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't mind series six, and it, I think it has aged really well. It's gotten better with age. It, it's it's not great, but I have a bit of soft spot for it. Okay, so the camera died for this section because this video is running way too long. So this is all going to be voiceover. Let's speed through. Oh, Series 7 is not a good season. I think it's better than these two, but it's it's scarcely best thinking about. Series 7 is not good. And I was surprised revisiting it just how not good it was. The first half is just... I, the tone of it is really weird. The ponds have nowhere to go as characters anymore. They're just there. And I think... It's just a really lackluster run and then the second half which gets a lot of points because it does kind of kick it up the arse a little bit And it does feel a bit fresher. Unfortunately, I just don't think the stories are that good I just think like Nightmare and Silver's awful. Hyde's oh, is, Hyde's pretty all right. Unfortunately, I just think the, the tone again the tone is is weird I don't like the 11th Doctor in this series. Matt Smith's probably my favorite Doctor. William Hartnell and Matt Smith are my two favorites the oldest and the youngest I don't know what they did to his character in Series 7B, but this this 11th Doctor, I'm not a bit, big fan of. I don't like how he's characterised in that latter half of the series. and it, It's better in, um, in Day of the Doctor, but it, in the series itself, it's just like, whoa, I don't like that. Don't like that. <laughs> um, it's, it's it, yeah, I don't know what they did to his character. Matt Smith's still great, but um, when I say he's my favourite Doctor along with William Hartnell, I'm talking about series 5, 11, not series 7. Yeah, not not good. Not good at all, really. Uh, definitely, I think, the weakest of the modern series. Series 8. So, series 8 and 9, I have said before, used to be my, my two least favourite Doctor Who series ever. Rewatching them, they're not for me, but I get what they're doing. And I respect it and I appreciate it. And I actually had a good time with series 8 this time around. It's deeply, deeply, deeply flawed. But... I had a good time with it this time around, and I, I'm going to put it in Still Got Legs. Yeah, thinking about it, like, I think the first half, there's a lot of variety to. Like, I really like Robot of Sherwood. Listen, I, I, I've really found a new appreciation for that this time. I think that's a very clever script. It's, it's a lovely story, and I always... I, I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it as a kid, and I think that is a weakness with this era. I don't think kids really get it. I don't think kids... 
I don't think it appeals to kids at all. I think Capaldi's really fun as the very angry Doctor. However, I think they went way too far with making the 12th Doctor unlikable because there are points in this where he, he he's just a nasty piece of work and it's not fun to watch. But you know what? Series 8, there's solid stuff in it overall and I'm I'm kind of I'm glad that I've that I've gained a new appreciation for it because it's 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 not terrible and overall I think it's good. And um kind of ditto with series 9 really because I think series 9 again it just isn't for me. I'm gonna put it at the at, at, well, yeah. Hmm. I'm gonna put it here in. Oh, I was never happy with that one, but it was always my least favourite, and I never thought that'd change. I just think it, and I, I still think it's it's pretentious and self-serious and not nearly as clever as it thinks it is. But I get what it's doing now. The the finale doesn't annoy me nearly as much. I've really like I, I heaven sent. I used to really dislike as a kid, and you can see on my channel, but it is. A phenomenal piece of work. I mean, come on. I don't, you know, I, I kind of hate myself that I, I dismissed it really. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's terrific. I just don't find the season very fun. The, the thing the thing with series nine is just not very fun for me. And uh, it's similar to season eighteen where I think it just goes too far in the one direction. And it's fine. It works, but it's just not for me. And that's that's really what it is. But I get it now, and I've gained a new appreciation for it. And that's maybe the best thing to have come out of this marathon, is just gaining a new appreciation for that whole era. But, yeah. We've got Series 10. Oh, I really like it. I'll put it there. I, I think the thing with Series 10 is, I'd always liked it, but this time was where I was like, I can confidently say that I love that series. I think it's such a great series. Purely, to be honest, for Bill Potts, I think Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts is just a lovely, lovely character. I adore that character and I think she is the strongest she's what really lifts the series up the pilot is one of my favorite Doctor Who's I think now watching that it's it's just magical it's just a lovely reinvention of the show and it's soft reinvention but it's a lovely reinvention and I think it's just all down to Bill it's the thing the thing is I get what they were doing with the Clara Doctor dynamic the kind of toxicity arc of it I get it however when you get to Bill and he, she is just so wholesome and lovely and she's going on adventures and like there's a bit in Smile and she's just like thanks for thanks for bringing me this is a great day out and I, I was just watching that and just thinking oh my god this is this is what I've been missing for the last two series and the whole series is, is you know the Monk's trilogy drags it down it, it does definitely drag it down but the other episodes like literally the other nine episodes are all great I you know I always thought Eaters of Light was a bit weak watching it this time it's really good fun yeah I love series 10 it's so warm and colorful and bright and and optimistic and it just takes me back to kind of the summer it aired and it just it just is so kind of uplifting to watch and then of course you get to the finale which is so dark um, but so brilliant and, and, and you know, gets to the, the, the core of the character of the Doctor in such, a, such an incredible way. It's just a fantastic run and uh, I'll always love it. Series 11, I think, goes above Series 6 and it goes and still got legs. Because Series 11, you can say what you will about it, but ultimately it's a really solid run that marches to the beat of its own drum doesn't give a fuck what you think about it. It feels like this is when the Chibnall era had something to say, which is not something that really happens again. I just think it's great. I just think it, I, I just really enjoy it. I just think it's it's bright and it's colourful and it's fun. And no, not all the stories are great. Um, and I think you'd be you'd be you'd be foolish to argue otherwise. But it's a solid run, and I have spoken about it in more detail on my channel in my Thirteenth Doctor retrospective. Um, so watch that for more info but yeah it's good series 12 however scarcely best thinking about it may be my least favorite modern series in fact you know what maybe it is my new least favorite series ever yeah it might be oh it might be oh that's the first time i've actually referred to it as that series 12 just for me betrays everything that was so cool and unique about series 11 and it just does worse versions of what Stephen Moffat was doing with the show and what Stephen Moffat was doing with the show wasn't really something that I was like hugely enthused about to begin with so a worse version of that is not something that I'm going to enjoy and when you're just doing you're just rehashing the master and the cybermen and Gallifrey for the umpteenth time in a series finale I'm just not interested I think the whole series is just so lifeless really 
and I think all of the surprises that were introduced into it, like the Fugitive Doctor and all of that, all of that stuff, they just feel so empty, and it sucks to say. But uh, there it is. <laughs> oh god, Doctor Who Flux. Uh, oh, I was never happy with that one. Um, we'll put it in. Yeah, we'll put it there. It, it the the fact that Flux exists is kind of a miracle in and of itself, and as a result, it deserves a lot of praise for the fact that, like, Chibnall and co made this shit under a pandemic and made a series of this scale. Unfortunately, it just falls apart a little bit. Too. So, it's, you know, it falls apart at the end, but actually, watching it again for this marathon, I don't think that the first four episodes were as good as I remembered them being either. I really like War of the Sontarans and I really like Village of the Angels. I just don't think it's well written, basically. I just don't think it's well written and I don't think it really works. Which is a shame, really. When I finished re-watching it this time, I, w I was like, I kind of can't imagine watching that again outside of a marathon setting. So, yeah. I don't know, I appreciate a lot of what it does, but it's not great. And finally, the 60th anniversary specials uh, will go in uh, top of Still Got Legs. They're good. Uh, actually, no. No, 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 no. Bottom of I Really Like It. I don't think the 60th specials were like masterpieces by any means, but they were all really good fun. I have problems with like the bi generation stuff in the giggle, and I think it, it's. You know, I would have preferred them to go a different way with the whole story of the of the three. However, the production value on them, you can just feel RTD is back in the in the showrunner's chair because it just just all the stuff that I loved about his era, it just feels like it's back in, in terms of just how characters speak with each other and the tone of it. I I I, I like them overall. I don't think that they were like stellar but I think they were really good fun, and I really enjoyed watching them. So that's it. Um, after God knows how long, by the time I've edited this down, we've ranked every single season of Doctor Who, and uh, I got a feeling a lot of my choices will be quite controversial, particularly like the Stephen Moffat stuff and how high I've put some seasons. But you know what? The great thing uh, about doing this marathon, what I really found was watching these stories in order... Well, you it's a completely different thing than watching them randomly. You just get a sense for how the show is evolving and changing and how the actors' performances are as well. And the best thing, I mean, you can see there, there's none in the No More section. There's no season of Doctor Who that I outright hate anymore. And that was an incredible gift coming away from that marathon. That was all I wanted. I can safely say I find something to appreciate in every single run. And that's great. Even the stuff that, even the ones that I don't really like as much. You know what? That's the magic of Doctor Who, you know, there's there's highs and there's low, there's high highs and low lows, but ultimately it's all good fun and I've wanted to rank everything for a while, so actually doing this has been really good fun, but um, yes, if you made it this far, thank you for watching, <laughs> uh, feel free to post your own kind of rankings in the comments and, and tell me your thoughts on the list, and uh, I'll see you again real soon in the new year, take care now.